Uh, Graham McConney, I work for Cognizant. Um, for any of you that don't know, Cognizant is a, a global systems integrator, 355,000 people. So, so um, we're trying to grow. Um, before I worked at Cognizant, I worked for an organization a little bit smaller. We're about 100 people um, as head of delivery. And our specialism at Inner Wisdom was AI and data. And then about three years ago, we were purchased by Cognizant. That's why I'm, I'm now in Cognizant. So a bit of a scale up from 100 people to 355,000. What I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon, talk with you about this afternoon, is um, some of our experiences over the last six years working with customers in trying to get AI into their organizations um, kind of beneficially. So trying to get real value out of AI. Do I need to stand on the stage? Is that going to be better for you? Sure. Um, so I, I kind of played with a few titles on this one. I think the official one is, can we make the AI hype a reality? I also kind of toyed with from hype to value. Um, I also like the um, title of do believe the hype. If any of you are above a certain age, you'll understand the reference there. But anyway, we've settled on, we've settled on this one. As I said, I want to just spend some time having a conversation with you about our experiences with with AI. Um, I think many of you will have seen this kind of the, the Gartner hype curve. So what kind of Gartner have seen is that with all of these new technologies, there's a great kind of, once the technology is broken out into the consciousness, there's a massive hype of expectation that increases and increases and increases. And then following that, there's this, what they refer to as the trough of disillusionment. So everyone says, all those things that were said about this amazing technology, it's all, it, it hasn't happened. And then gradually, we kind of, as an industry, we come out of that um, realization, sorry, expectations that become a bit more realistic. And then gradually, the, the, the tool, the technology starts to be productive to the organization. And my discussion today is about whether we can shallow out that trough of disillusionment in, in the kind of AI and gen AI sphere. Um, I don't know what the format is usually for these things, but if, you have a, if I say something you think, mm, I'm not sure I agree with that, just, just let me know. It'd be good to have a bit of a conversation. Um, it isn't just about hype, okay? Um, you all know this. Uh, you've pro probably everyone has got ChatGPT or has played with ChatGPT. Um, there's Gemini from Google. There's Claude, which is a, one of the large language models from a company called Anthropic. We use Claude quite a lot in the solutions that we develop. The key thing is that these technologies are literally at people's fingertips. These are all apps. All of these um, Gen AI large language models are available as apps on everyone's phone. So it's, it's really quite a significant thing. Yes, it's massively hyped in the industry, but pretty well every single person has got has got access to these tools. So it's not just about industry hype. Um, some interesting stacks to give some context. ChatGPT from launch to a million users was done in five days. Um, qu quite impressive. Uh, the other interesting thing about this stat that I thought was that if you look at the other um, services, technologies, products that launched and got to a million users quickly, they're kind of all obvious customer kind of Joe Public propositions, right? Whereas two years ago, AI and Gen AI were, were very much in the back room. And all of a sudden, they've kind of exploded and massively exploded into public consciousness. So I think that's really significant, that this kind of weird technology that no one seems to understand is still massively popular. Some other kind of context stuff, don't read the whole slide. Essentially what it says is about 50% of Americans um, are familiar in some way with ChatGPT. And this is only ChatGPT. If you look at the other LLMs, there's going to be a greater degree of familiarity. Um, and by familiarity, it's either that they've used it themselves or that they know someone that uses it or have worked with someone that uses it. So that's massive penetration in a little under two years. 42% of Americans think that AI will have a negative impact. I'm sure most of us will have 
heard, participated in these discussions about Gen AI in particular. Is it going to be good for us? Is it going to dis destroy jobs? Or what's it going to do? So there's quite a few. I mean, I think that's quite a high number of people that are looking at this technology and thinking it's not going to be great for society. Um, but I thought it was interesting that 27% of those think it's not going to be interesting, it's not going to be good for society, but I'll be okay. Excuse me? I'll be okay. So, again, interesting background context. How is it that companies, against that background, so against all the industry hype, um, and looking at the fact that this is very much in the news, how is it that organizations are responding to um, AI and Gen AI? And I will say uh, uh, now, I will use the terms AI and Gen AI kind of indiscriminately, because I, I, we don't really differentiate between the two. Gen AI being the, the newest, sexiest incarnation of this technology. But I'll use them both interchangeably. Um, Boston Consulting Group, so a well-known management consultancy, um, their stats suggest, in summary, most organizations, almost all organizations, are talking about AI and Gen AI. Um, so they're going to do something with AI. That's their plan. However, again, some stats from uh, Boston Consulting Group and from McKinsey, if you can't quite make that out, most organizations, while they're talking about AI and Gen AI, most organizations haven't really achieved very much with this technology. We, in a wisdom and, and Cognow, um, or I personally, have been working with organizations, delivering solutions with AI and Gen AI for the last six years. Um, yet, we sit here in 2024 with just a relatively small number of organizations having, having been successful with this stuff. So can I just, um, just ask really briefly, anyone, anyone in the room done stuff with AI within your organization, um, been able to experiment with it, been able to get it to production, Any, anyone? Yeah, just, just let me know, shout it out. Yeah? Yes. Anyone else? I had his hand up, but that's okay. We'll move on. Um, okay. Some more context. This kind of echoes the previous slide, really, that 90% of organizations, according to BCG, are sitting on their hands. They've decided that this technology is important. They've decided that this technology is the future. They are going to invest in it, but, but not yet. They're going to wait. They're going to let other people make the mistakes. They're going to let other people do the experimentation. They're going to let other people make the investments. And then they're going to kind of ride on those coattails. Um, I guess my challenge to them would be, can you afford to do that? Can you afford to wait until your competitors have taken advantage of this technology and done something with it? With it? Um, I, the last thing I'll say in terms of context is I completely get why that last stat, the 90% sitting on their hands, I completely understand why that is. Um, first of all, we all know that doing tech, doing digital is risky. Um, for those of you that have never uh, 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 read, have you come across something called the Standish Group or the Standish Report or the Chaos Report? If you haven't, it's, um, it's definitely something that you should take a look at. So every, I think it's every 10 years now, they produce a report um, into why IT projects fail, why digital, why digital projects fail. Um, so it's a great read in terms of understanding how you as an individual professional can do things better. But the really sad thing from my perspective is, that that statistic of about 66% of digital projects 
failed to meet their objectives, that has been really consistent for like 40 years. So since Standish first did their research in 85, it's been about that number. So most digital projects fail to meet their objectives. So against that background, it's not surprising that 90% of business leaders are thinking, we don't want to make the mistakes, we don't want to spend the money. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is change is difficult. So not technology, but organizational change is difficult. Um, that really difficult to see diagram over on the right hand side at the bottom, that's the J curve of change. So if you're going to introduce a change into your organization, you're going to, you're going to be impacted by the scale is performance on the Y scale and time on the X scale. So your performance in a particular area where you're going to introduce this change is going to dip. You're going to get a performance impact first, and then it will pick up, and then gradually you'll see a performance improvement. So who wants to go through that dip in performance? Who wants to have that kind of negative impact? Um, and lots of organizations, the, the red, uh, apologies for it being so faint, the red line that you see that, that fails to get up to the zero axis again, that's where people think, this is too hard, we're going to stop, and the change doesn't happen, and then they don't get the benefits. So against that background, tech is risky, change is hard. It's not surprising that organizations want to sit on their hands. OK, some successes. I noticed a bit earlier that there was someone from Octopus Energy here. So if they are still here, I'm going to have to be really careful with what I say. Um, so this Octopus Energy is not an organization that I've worked with, but it's a, I think it's a reasonably well-known Gen AI case study. Octopus Energy, you probably all know, is one of the big energy companies. They are far and away the one that has the best reputation with customers. So year after year, they have had, um, they've been seven years running a which recommended energy supplier. So they're, they're very good at supply and energy and, and customer service, customer responsiveness. Back in 2023, so last year, February time, they decided to introduce an LLM, a large language model, a Gen AI. In, in this case, it was ChatGPT. They introduced it to their customer contact center to answer emails. And what they found within about three months is that customer satisfaction with responses to emails went up from 65% to 80%. Um, the other thing that they found really quickly within three months was that they could get this LLM to do about 30% of the work in responding to emails. So they've done two really good things there. They have increased customer satisfaction and they have dramatically lowered their costs. As I said, it's a well-known case study we haven't worked with or I haven't worked with Octopus but I'm going to talk about a couple of organizations that we have worked with. This organization I can't name, but we did something similar to what Octopus did for this, also an energy company. So we created that illustration over on the left and on the right hand side. It's like a listening center. So emails come into the organization. They get triaged with um, a large language model. In this case, we're using Claude from Anthropic. And that triage consists of pulling data points out of that email. So pull out the account number, pull out the customer number, pull out the email address. So pull out those and, and create structured data from that unstructured email. And also summarize the email. Tell me what it is. Is it a, a request for an account? Is it, a rest for an, a, is it an address change? Is it a, a billing query? So tell me what it is so that we can send this email to the relevant people to handle. And also, from the email content, give me an indication of their disposition, their demeanor. So if they're a happy customer, then maybe we can prioritize it less. If they're an unhappy customer, maybe we need to accelerate giving a response. And then the final thing this triage center does is it drafts a response back to that email. Now, um, they as does Octopus Energy, as do most organizations that we deal with, with these types of contact management solutions. 
do retain a human in the loop. So there is someone that looks at that listening center, sees the summary of the inbound email, reads the draft and then says, yes, the draft is okay, send it. So there is still a human in the loop. There is still that degree of control. But the thing that I think will be interesting will be at some point when the organization decides that it no longer needs to have that human in the loop. But for now, that human in the loop is there. Just from getting the LLM to understand and triage the email, they saw a 33% reduction in effort. So we didn't completely reorganize and re-engineer their process. We just put an LLM on the front of that, and that in itself led to a 33% reduction in, in effort. So again, a kind of staggering benefit. Um, this is another organization that we're still working with um, called Williams Lee. They're a global business services organization. And the solution that we've built for them is something called Engage Transcribe. One of the things that Williams Lee does is customers from around the world, so accountancies, law firms, all sorts of professional services firms, will have audio files that they need to be transcribed into text. Um, before this solution, they did that manually, and there was a process of someone looks at it, does a transcription, they go through retranscribe to check their transcription, and then someone else comes along, looks at it again, and checks it. So it's a really laborious process. Um, with the use of an LLM, we've been able to do that automatically. Again, they still have someone in, they have a human in the loop that will do a, a kind of final eyeball, but they have had a dramatic decrease in the amount of time it takes them to, to deliver those transcriptions. I can't name figures for commercial reasons, but it is kind of really stunning figures in terms of improvement. Final organization to talk about, um, a company called Aramex that we worked with for a few years. They are a global courier company. So if you have a package to be delivered, you give them their package, they will deliver it anywhere in the world. Um, we started working with them, gosh, about five years ago. They had been struggling to get their first AI-based solution to production. They'd been struggling for three years. Um, and this is not, what I'm gonna say next is not about our quality. Let me just say that in advance. They'd been struggling for three years. Uh, we took this skeleton machine learning model that was done in SageMaker and we delivered it to production in 10 weeks, okay? Um, so that kind of effectiveness of the delivery function and understanding how you do AI, all of that stuff I'm not gonna talk around so much today. The thing that I want to talk about is that the implementation of this solution led to a 40% reduction in calls to their contact center. So that is people that would send a package and then a couple of days later to ring up and say, Where, where's my package? When's it gonna be delivered? Um, with a solution that the transit time prediction, what it does is it, at the point when you ask for a quote for your package to be delivered, it will tell you how long it's gonna take for that package to be delivered. So you no longer have to call the contact center because you know how long it's gonna to take to deliver. That led to a 40% reduction in calls to the contact center. So the key thing about these examples that I've given is that the driver and the measure is a business benefit. We're not doing this stuff just to say that we've done Gen AI or to say that we've done something clever or to talk about a new solution. The driver has been, we're delivering something that is gonna make a massive material difference to the business. And that has to be our kind of, that has to be our driver, that has to be our goal. Um, I like BCG, as you can tell. So another, another kind of stat graph from BCG is, so what is it that good companies, what is it that the Octopus Energies, the Williams Lees, et cetera, et cetera, what is it that they're doing that the other 90% who are sitting on their hands that they could do? Um, and we at Cognizant would distill that down into four things. BCG refers to five. Number one, strong value alignment. 
Number two, on-demand incremental data. Number three, executive drive. Number four, responsibility. And I'll, let me go through each of those in, in turn. Right, this is, a, this is a bit of a hectic graph, so um, apologies. This is the approach that we take to helping organizations do AI. Over on the left-hand side in kind of light blue, the first thing that we need to do is help them to shape a portfolio. And that portfolio is a set of identified use cases. So this is where we can use AI stroke gen AI. So to come up with that list of potential use cases, and then the shaping bit is that we have to understand the benefits and the costs and the constraints of those individual use cases. And out of the end of this portfolio shaping comes a roadmap, do this first, then do this, then do these two, et cetera. So that's a really critical thing, getting the right sequence of use cases in order to drive continuous incremental improvements to the business. David Anderson, I think, kind of referred to this in his, in his talk, that it's about delivering frequent value to the business. And that's what we're trying to do with that portfolio, with the roadmap, is to continue to deliver value to the business. Then the other thing that we're doing is capability assessment. Not every organization is geared up to really utilizing the benefits of this kind of technology. So one of the first things that we do is just take a bit of a look at the organization to see where it's strong, where it's weak, where there may be challenges. And in parallel with developing the tech, we're also going to support the organization in improving their kind of underlying operational capabilities. Um, so that's the blue kind of blueprint bit, the shaping bit. And then the kind of darker blue in the middle, we go through a four-stage process to deliver in uh, AI and Gen AI solutions. The first is we do a proof of value or a proof of concept, depending on which terminology you want to use. We seek to do two things in that proof of value. Number one, does the technology work in their environment, with their data, with their context? So is it, is it viable? We know that Gen AI works, but is Gen AI going to work on Octopus Energy's emails? Is, is AI going to work on Aramex's particular set of characteristics in terms of their data? So is it going to work, number one? Number two, if it does work, is there a value to the business? And if we get a positive out of both of those, then it makes sense to move on. Those proof of values we do, I think, quite quickly. Um, we used to do those proof of values in about five weeks. Um, we've stretched it a little bit because we need to, we've recognized that we need to engage more with the business, with the change. So we've stretched it for that reason. But in eight weeks, we'll do, is it going to work in your organization and does it make sense? Is it worthwhile? One of the things that we've seen talking to customers is that they often themselves spend weeks or months in that proof stage. And that's one of the reasons, Aramex, for example, one of the reasons why it took them three years to not productionize their first model was that they spent all of those three years in proof. So if you want to do this stuff, set really clear parameters for success in your proof and make that proof really quite specific on is it going to work and is it valuable. The next stage is the, the realize is to produce an MVP. Um, the sole purpose of an MVP is to do the absolute minimum that allows the organization to pilot this stuff. The absolute minimum. Um, and what we're trying to get out of that MVP is the organization saying the benefits that were identified, they're real. And once we've got that um, acknowledgement or positive, then it makes sense to build out the solution properly. And again, another, I guess another anti-pattern that we've seen talking to customers is that they move to, they skip that MVP kind of realized stage. So once they've proved something, then they go straight to productionizing it. Um, 
the business isn't ready, the benefits aren't delivered, and then the project gets canned. So it's really important to have that kind of mid-stage of producing an MVP and having a real AB pilot operational test to make sure that this is going to deliver something beneficial to the organization. Then finally, we'll do the scale up, which is building all the different paths, the happy paths, the unhappy paths, putting in all the non-functionals, and we have a full, resilient, performant, end-to-end -end application or solution that can be deployed and then evolved in the organization. Um, we are quite, when we work with customers, we're quite rigid in going through those stages to those kind of timescales because it drives value quicker. And also, if we've got an initiative that's going to fail, we can get to a failure point really quickly without spending too much. So we're really quite disciplined in going through those stages. Um, looking at strong value alignment, what does that mean? Um, when we, just going back to the portfolio shaping bit, we typically identify tens, maybe even hundreds of use cases where AI and Gen AI can be useful to an organization. And we look at them through, through this lens. We look at a number of factors for benefit, strategy, who's going to benefit, how they're going to benefit, scalability, return on investment, all of those things we look at from a benefit point of view. In terms of achievability, we look at the narrow technical um, feasibility of something, but we also look at the risks involved operationally in doing that. We look at the organization's capacity and ability to change in order to realize the benefit. And we look at kind of compliance and regulatory factors. So we take all of these things into consideration when we look at those use cases. And we plot them on something like that grid over on the right-hand side. And the axis, the x-axis is, um, let me get this right. The x-axis is benefit, and the y-axis is achievability. So if we can get something in the top right-hand corner, high benefit to the organization, high availability, those are the ones that we go for first. Because what we want to do, particularly at the start of a relationship or the start of a program, is we need success. And success isn't about whether the technology is delivered. Success is about how it's moved an operation indicator in the business. Success at Aramex was, if we wanted to, we could remove 40% of our customer contact center people, if we wanted to. That's, that's the degree of success. And once you have that degree of success, it's then quite easy to go back for more investment to do more things. If you don't have that sort of success, it's a, it's a struggle. So getting that strong alignment to the, to the needs of the business is really critical for, for doing something useful with AI and Gen AI. Um, another hectic diagram, not going to go through it all. The point we're trying to make here is that as well as the technology stuff that we have to do, the technology that we have to build, there are many organizational levers that have to be pulled in order to assure that the organization is ready for this technology. And we need an executive within the organization that's going to do that. At Aramax, we worked directly for the, the chief digital officer who was on the board of Aramax. And other organizations we've worked with senior directors or, um, or chief officers because we need them to drive the change in the organization. If that drive, if that change isn't driven by an executive with some degree of power, then the technology that we build is going to be of no benefit. So that's a really important element. Um, on demand incremental data. Two, two examples of organizations. One is Aramex, and another one is another organization that I won't name. The other organization that I won't name, we um, delivered the first use case for them that was about operational visibility. Um, they're a UK-wide organization with about three billion in, in sales a year. And it took about three or four weeks for them to be able to see what they'd sold. Not great. Um, so the first use case wasn't actually AI or Gen AI. It was just delivering them visibility so they could see what they sold 10 minutes ago rather than three weeks ago. So that was great. That was a success. Pat on the back. You've done well. Um, and then they decided, is that too 
Has that gone up in volume? Um, then they decided that they wanted to pull into the, this data platform that we built for them all of the organization's data. Um, a task that we thought was going to take about two years. We really tried to encourage them not to do that, but that's what they insisted on doing. We got about a year into that program, and then a new CFO and a new um, procurement officer decided this program was too expensive and the program was canned. Okay, so that's, that's anti-pattern. Um, Aramex did it in a different way. Once we delivered that first AI use case for transit time, and it delivered a 40% reduction in, in customer contact, inbound customer contact, we picked the next thing that was a significant issue for the business and delivered that. And they secured the benefit. And then we picked the next thing, and then we picked the next thing. All the while that those new facilities were being delivered to the business, we were gradually pulling more and more data into the new data platform. Um, but pulling data onto the data platform was not the driver. The driver was, what is it that we can do to deliver benefit to the organization? And we, we would pull into the new platform just enough data to allow them to get that value. So this on-demand incremental data is, don't try and pull it all in, just pull in enough, just clean enough, just structure enough to allow you to, uh, to deliver on value providing use cases for the business. And then finally, responsibility guardrails. Now, can you, I want you all to kind of remember this because I'm going to test you at the end of the questions bit. Um, there's, there's a lot there in terms of responsible AI. Um, the point that I'd like to make about responsible AI is that if you don't attend to these things, they will stop a project from going live. They will stop a project from going into operations. Um, and sometimes relatively late in the day, someone, legal, commercial, will say, hang on a second, we can't do this. We all have to stop. So one of the things that we do in that capability assessment phase is that we understand how good the organization is at putting those guardrails in place. We do a bit of a heat map, and then areas where they're kind of red and amber will help them to improve those bits of policy or process or standards so that when the technology is ready, the organization is comfortable that they are compliant and that those guardrails are in place. So, there's a lot to think about, but it's really important to do it in parallel with developing the technology. <clears throat> so, in, in summary, for, from our perspective, from my perspective, the, the things that I've learned over the last six years with this stuff, to, to get success out of AI and Gen AI, and by success I mean a business that gets real value out of it, for me, these are the four things. Strongly aligned to the business and the strategy. Um, an executive that you're working really closely with that's going to drive the operational change. Um, not trying to bore the ocean in terms of structuring and organizing and managing data. And finally, putting those guardrails in place to make sure that your organization is comfortable to apply this technology. This was always present with, with AI solutions. It is more present, it is more significant with Gen AI because of some of the ethical bias IP issues that are associated with AI and Gen AI, sorry, with Gen AI. Um, so those are, the, those are the kind of four things that if you want to move beyond the hype and have AI that really delivers, those are the kind of four elements of success in our experience. That's all I wanted to do. Um, any any kind of questions? Very tight on time. Let's do a question or two. Oh, 
Have you ever worked with companies that are very hesitant when it comes to data security? So uh, PII or sensitive data going into a generative AI or LLM, and how do you cope with them challenges? Sorry, what was, that? What was the bit you said after data security? Uh, so when uh, companies have problems with data security around PII, you know, private identity and identifiable information or sensitive information, for example, with Octopus, with customer emails coming in, how do you deal with the challenges with companies that are very hesitant about providing that sensitive data to LLMs? Um, there's, there's a technical answer to that, and there's, a, um, I guess, an operational answer to that. The technical answer is that the, when we've deployed those LLMs, we've deployed them in a, in a, in a private environment. So we're not using commercial LLMs. We're using a, the same technology, but a, um, effectively a local version uh, within the VPC of that organization. Um, so they don't have to worry about their data seeping out into the general public. The, the model sits within their environment. So that's the kind of technical answer. The operational answer is that that list of things that we had at the end, um, you have to go through all of those um, and make sure that the data is secure, there is no bias, all of those things need to be attended to. And there isn't, a, there isn't really a shortcut to dealing with those, but you need to deal with those in parallel with developing the solution. Because as you've pointed out, you'll get to a point relatively late in the day when someone in the organization says no, because we're not comfortable that data isn't gonna seep out into the general public. So technologically, we can do that. We can wall the technology off, but also you need to give your colleagues comfort that you know that there's a problem and you've dealt with it. So I would say those two things. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask who else, right? So anybody else, right, because there are a few, um, and we are over time. I'm going to ask if you would you mind answering them uh, during the break. Not at all. Yeah, that's Otherwise, fine. we'll run right in. So Joe and uh, I can't remember who the other person was. Come up to the front, have a chat with Graham, uh, and please another round of applause for Graham. Thank you.